Hello, everybody, and welcome to yet another amazing talk at this year's Academy. Uh, the next talk will be about KDE Frameworks uh, 6, or the next KDE Frameworks, and it will be given by Dr. Kevin Uttens, uh, the guy who is mean in code reviews and very, very nice in person. So, hit it up, Kevin. Thank you, Ivan. All right, so let's get started with this. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to this talk. Um, so the goal here is to give a rough uh, overview about how uh, KDE Frameworks is structured. Um, and I will cover uh, in particular at, toward the end um, an idea which has been discussed during the uh, last um, KDE Framework Sprint. Uh, and admittedly, that part is more or less food for thought for the upcoming uh, KD Framework 6 both. Right. First, for those who don't know me, so I started to use KD uh, as a teenager, basically, so way back in the time. Uh, I didn't start contributing right away and waited a few years before doing this. Uh, and when I did that, that was love at first sight. Uh, I loved the community back then. I still love it uh, nowadays. Um, and so I've been doing things here and there. Uh, in particular, I've been stuck quite a bit in KDE Libs. Um, and I participated in the uh, setup of the KDE Frameworks architecture. Uh, I also do some community stuff. So I helped with uh, facilitating the creation of the KDE manifesto. And nowadays, you might have seen some of my blog posts uh, where I'm uh, using in community data analytics to see how communities are doing, uh, and of course, in particular, KD or subparts of uh, KD. Uh, shameless plug, I would have another talk about this uh, with a colleague of mine uh, next Friday. Um, and so, nowadays, I'm uh, working at uh, Enio Cloud Couture. Uh, where we are doing services around uh, development um, and mostly tech lead as a service uh, type jobs, uh, architecture jobs, and so on. And I'm living uh, in Toulouse, so in the southwest of France. All right, uh, those who know me, uh, those who attended the training yesterday, they know that I generally start with some uh, historic bits. Uh, so that's what we're, we are going to do now. Uh, and go back. All right. Apparently, it's too loud. Uh, I can probably do this, yes. Better now? I assume that's a yes. Um, all right, so let's go with the story. So way back in the time, uh, not right at the beginning, but somewhere in between, uh, we had something that we called the KD platform, uh, which was basically uh, KD libs and something named KD base runtime. Um, the thing at the time was that uh, we had a rather monolithic uh, development uh, model. And because of that, it was not that easy to actually know uh, the dependencies where they went. Right? It was, uh, that was a bit ad hoc. So uh, if you took something like uh, Plasma Desktop and looked at the dependencies, uh, it might not be readable for everyone. I think I can actually zoom in, yes, fancy. Um, so you get to see that the Plasma Desktop, for instance, would direct almost directly linked to libk text editor, right? Which would then pull in uh, libk parts straight from Plasma Desktop. Uh, or that you would have uh, WebKit LinkedIn, right? So lots of weird dependencies you wouldn't expect, right? Even things like KD in it, you would have links to K parts and to KIO, right? So that would bring quite a lot uh, just for something rather small as a service. Um, right, and so libplasma, you would see KIO uh, being linked directly, right, libk file being linked uh, directly. So that's kind of what you get as, I was about to say weird, but that's more surprising dependencies, right, when you have more of a monolithic uh, model. 
um, most uh, you get dependencies which make sense, and then you get some others which are more opportunistic. Right? Well, it's just there in the same repository, and we release at the same time. So that's probably fine, right? If I just link to that, that's how you might end up with a big ball of mud at some point. So back in 2010, uh, there's been uh, one of the Plasma meetings, so one uh, which were called Tokamaks. Uh, and so during the Tokamak 4, in the snow, um, there's been discussions around that, right? And well, someone basically took an ax <laughs> uh, and decided to do something about, uh, about the world problem. Um, that led to that uh, presentation, uh, which was, so that's a um, screenshot of the first slide, uh, named KD Platform Profiles, uh, low fat KD platform for your pleasure. Um, and the, between the parentheses, if you look, there's the KD5 free, right? No added sugar. So that was even before we considered, you know, going to really going to Qt5 and coming up with uh, KD frameworks. And already back then, there were discussions about how can we do better regarding the dependencies. Uh, and the idea of the platform profiles was to say you could have the desktop profile with everything and all the dependencies, right? And then you could have, uh, if I remember correctly, that was something like a tablet profile. So you would we would cut at compile time for uh, that form factor some of the dependencies, and then you would lose features. And then for the mobile, we would cut some more dependencies, and then you would lose features, right? So that was kind of a stopgap measure to try to bring less dependencies because you're going to smaller and smaller devices. Um, obviously, that was kind of influenced by the presence of a famous bootmaker uh, around our community at the time. Um, but that never was really satisfactory, right? The world, we do it at compile time. Uh, so that means it's actually harder to test and validate uh, in QA. Um, and because then your test matrix is just bigger, right? You have to compile with all the different type of flags. Um, and the fact that you would lose features, right? And one of the things is that we want all of our libraries to work well together and provide a very integrated uh, experience uh, when you get them. And there was no way to reclaim that experience, right? If some stuff was installed. So fast tracking uh, more than a year, that's uh, where we had the Platform 11 um, uh, meeting, which means that was 10 years ago now, right? Uh, that was in June uh, 2011 uh, back then. Um, and so we've been looking at more of those graphs. Uh, and so for instance, that the Akonedi uh, console dependencies, uh, which was a good one because it tended for various reasons to link to everything. Uh, so I looked quite a bit to, to that one uh, because we could see plenty of the different paths uh, in, our, in our dependencies. That was something we did uh, in a cabin in the Swiss Alps, basically. So when you go there, uh, well, you, I mean, a bunch of kids uh, in a cabin, uh, what, what could possibly go wrong, right? Um, more prosaically, right, you get a bunch of geeks in the middle of nowhere, so they just spend their time with codes and graphs and looking at stuff, right? So that was actually a very, um, very, very productive meeting. Uh, we ended up uh, lining up quite a lot of tasks. Uh, that picture was taken in that particular cabin at the beginning of the meeting. Uh, so you could see that all the tasks, most of all the tasks are on, on the left-hand side. Uh, and I don't remember the number, but that was really huge. Uh, and that's pretty much how it looked at the, um, the night of the last day, right? Uh, so everything is on the right. So a lot of stuff was done there. Uh, most of those tasks were about looking at each libraries and each problematic dependencies we identified in those libraries. Uh, so it was a lot of, lot of work uh, from quite a few individuals uh, during that meeting. And that's how we came up with uh, the KD Frameworks 5 dependency plan. Um, 
So there are several things to notice in there. Uh, so I know that Volker regret the color palette which is used there, uh, but that's your fault, so you have to live with it now. Um, but one thing you can notice is that we already see you know, those rows, those columns, right, uh, which says, well, the tiers, right? We get the idea of the tiers already, right? And uh, we get the columns for the different type uh, of frameworks, right? Um, which is something we still roll with uh, nowadays. Uh, there are a few things which are a bit forgotten. So for instance, if you look at K-Parts, right? K-Parts was meant to be in that particular box, which we call Duke and Feel and Consistency. Uh, it's not a, a, at all how it ended up, right? Uh, it, it has a very different structure. Uh, K-Parts is uh, in tier three, uh, actually. Uh, one thing you might uh, notice, which it, I think got a bit lost uh, in time is that we had different shapes for them, right? Uh, because we are looking at is that core, is that GUI, is that widgets, right? Or some stuff which is mixed, right? And we would try to actually separate between the widget stuff and the GUI stuff and the core stuff uh, in different frameworks. We kind of relaxed that when we re arrived at the latest model. Um, and so that's the organizational matrix, which is still valid today. Uh, so it should look familiar, I think, to almost everyone who's been looking at the documentation of KD frameworks, because if you look at the API documentation, it, they are actually sorted, right? You have several tables, one per tier. So you get the tier one, tier two, tier three. Um, and so at least those should look familiar, right? But then we have the types, right? And so we have that solution type and we have the integration Qt addons and then we have functional Qt addons. Um, and, and if you look, they have dependency rules as well, right? Because we always talk about where well, something which is in tier three uh, can depend on something which is in tier three, right? Or on something which is in tier two. Something in tier two can depend on tier one and something in tier one can depend on nothing else than Qt and system libraries. That's basically what we have at the bottom. Uh, but then that was actually a bit more complex than that, because if you add a solution in tier two, well, because it's tier two, it can depend only on tier one stuff, right? But then it could depend only on solution tier one or on functional add-on tier one or integration add-on tier one. Now, if I have an integration add-on tier two, it's supposed to depend only on integration tier one or functional tier one. Right, and we kind of lost that uh, in, in the conversations, right? So um, I think that's a reason why we we kind of uh, of lost this, and I, I'm coming to it in a, in a minute. Uh, the reason why it's a bit unfortunate that it uh, got lost is that in a way we were when we had discussions back then we were thinking that moving a framework in that matrix wasn't only about moving it down, which is then kind of what we've been spending quite some time doing, right? Which is cutting the dependencies at build time and then moving it down in the tiers. Uh, but that was also about moving it toward the right, if that made sense for that particular framework, to move it toward the right, uh, because those are more about the runtime dependencies. So we wanted to get that uh, streamlined as well. So, here is my take on why uh, we kind of lost the types along the way. Is that if you look at the uh, policies that we have around frameworks, uh, that's the description of the type which I, uh, I took the extract there. So the constraint, constraints from types are the following functional Qt add ons cannot have runtime dependencies. Easy peasy, right? Integration Qt add ons can have an optional runtime dependency. Uh, uh, and aim at integrating with the underlying uh, operating system slash platform. It's becoming a bit odd, right? Because it can have a runtime dependency or not, right? But then there's an intent. Uh, and then you have solutions which have mandatory runtime dependencies because that's part of their design and where their added values come from. Things scalability, resource sharing, re resilience, and so on. That sounds complicated, right? I mean, um, it, it's complicated because in particular, you have one where it's a bit mixed up between the presence of runtime dependencies or not, right? Depending on the platform. And then there, it's mixed 
between this and the intent, right? It, it might not have any runtime dependency, but if the intent is integrating in an operating system, then it ends up there. Right? So it, it's kind of it feels messy, and for solutions, it's even worse, right? Uh, in a way. Um, and, and so because of that complexity, I think that's why it never quite picked up uh, in conversations. And somehow, it was a bit cl a clumsy attempt, right? Are trying to draw the line between this about a portable API, uh, which abstracts some platform facility, or is it an API which is more of a building block to make platforms? Right? Because we are in that situation where we are both making a platform and we are making applications, right? So that's kind of uh, that's kind of what we do. We we try to do both uh, all the time. Um, and so we're trying to draw that line somehow, right? And never quite managed to do this. So now we kind of catch up to, uh, with today, right? That the model which is in place with framework. So we see that we have that two by two, um, three by three matrix. Um, and unfortunately, we use that more like as a single vector and we kind of lost uh, the rest. Uh, in the metainfo.yaml though, both information appear. We can do stuff with that. So I went back to some of the old scripts we used to plot the dependencies, and I started to do it again with the AT frameworks we have today. So what we have there is that each blue dot uh, is actually one of the AT frameworks. Uh, and then we have an arrow if, between two of them if one depends on the other. So simple as like that. For the layout, I forced it so that each uh, layer of coins maps to a tier, okay? So we have tier one at the bottom, and we can see that there are plenty of them where no other frameworks actually depend on them. Um, and then we go one level up tier two, and then uh, one level up tier three, uh, which explains why you see some of the uh, horizontal dependencies, right? Because tier three can depend between uh, each other. Now, let's try to make this a bit more visual. So red, we got the functional framework now. Uh, green, that the integration. And then blue, that the solution frameworks, OK? Uh, so all RGB. Um, and so we start to actually see them, right? Then the obvious question is, because we lost the types in the conversations, is are we, respecting, are we actually respecting the rules we gave to ourselves? Uh, which is that I cannot have, for instance, an integration framework which would depend on a solution framework, right? Or a functional one which depends on uh, on a solution one. Which means you start you need to start coloring the rows as well, right? So you color them by the type um, of the framework having the dependency, right? Uh, and not the dependency itself. So that will be important in a minute. We will see. Because now if we zoom in, we start to see stuff like this, right? So my green dot there, so that's a zoom from the previous one we had, uh, it's fine, right? We got two solution frameworks, which are depending on an integration framework, right? Because remember, blue that the uh, solutions. Uh, and so we see two blue rows coming. So they are coming from two solutions toward an integration framework. So for three by three metrics, that's fine, right? And the red dot is OK as well, right? We got one solution uh, and one integration framework depending on a functional framework. We're still fine. And then we got that blue dot. We got so one solution framework depending on the solution framework, right? A blue arrow arriving, uh, which arrives on a blue dot, so we're fine. And then uh, we got one functional framework depending on the solution framework. And they are the rules we gave ourselves. Uh, that's supposed to be forbidden. Right, so that row here, right, is actually a problem. Right, we we actually violated one of the rules we gave ourselves. We gave ourselves for uh, KD framework slide. All right, so definitely something is fishy with the types. Right, uh, they are to understand. Uh, they didn't quite play their role uh, in the maturity system we envisioned. Right, because we never quite pushed. Uh, frameworks toward the right in that matrix, which I was showing earlier. Uh, it's one extra di and dimension, so that makes more things for people to think about. And that's why they kind of focus on the tiers, because they were easier to, to understand. 
And as we see, there are clearly a few mistakes in the metadata, right, that we have due to the above, right? So that asks the question, can we do uh, better than this? Um, so I think the problem we have here is that it's conflating two things, right? It's conflating system abstraction and, uh, and implementation in our frameworks right now. Um, so if we go back to the original intent of the types, that was to avoid conflating those two in the frameworks, basically. Um, so we provide platform abstractions for portable apps, and so in that way, KD Frameworks is an extended queue. Uh, but we also make building blocks for our own platform, right? So Plasma on top of X11 Wayland on top of some POSIX system, right? That's pretty much uh, what we do, and we do both, and there's a tension between those two. Uh, and, and that tension is not quite resolved, and both are inside the KDE Frameworks product, right? And that's kind of unfortunate. So the idea, which was a bit discussed uh, at, uh, at the last uh, KDE Framework Sprint, was to maybe say, have a different product, right? And to start saying, well, maybe some of that stuff shouldn't be, in a way, shouldn't be in KDE Frameworks, right? That's kind of a different conversation, but at least it shouldn't be labeled as KDE Frameworks, right? Because the expectation for people is that in KDE Frameworks, that's APIs you can use as an extended queue. And for some of them, uh, it's not quite true, right? If you take K-Wallet, it's not quite true. You're actually linking to a particular implementation of a password store, right? Um, and so there was this idea of saying, well, maybe there's some stuff which should be labeled as the Plasma API, right? Uh, because that's the building blocks for all workspace, for all full operating system, if you wish, uh, which we call Plasma, right? Um, and, and so I went with by well, looking at the frameworks and saying, okay, which ones are actually in that situation, right? So Baloo is kind of there. Uh, K activities as well, because K activities have no uh, equivalent on other platforms, right? So it's platform specific uh, due to this. Uh, K global access as well, K notify config, K runner, uh, obviously, K wallet, uh, as I mentioned. Plasma framework, very probably, right? And purpose. So the idea behind purpose is actually something which could be portable, right? But what we expose is one particular implementation for this. It's not abstracting you for actions which would work on Android, for instance. Um, and of course, there are more of those libraries which are actually released with Plasma itself, right? But that's out of scope for what I'm looking at right now, right? I'm really focusing on KD frameworks. Uh, so should applications use those APIs? Yeah, sure, why not, right? Uh, but they have to know that when they do this, they have a reduced portability, right? And so that if they want to do things well, they need to have uh, if devs. This is Plasma specific as soon as you touch one of those. Uh, and so that's similar to using Windows or Mac OS APIs directly, right? They just happen to be uh, APIs made with Qt, but they are still non-portable APIs. So let's go back to our coloring dots, right, with that in mind now. So let's say that instead of having the functional and uh, integration and solutions, I have only two colors, okay? Um, and, and so I will have uh, the ones which are not part of the Plasma API, uh, as I defined it on the previous slide, and the ones which are part of the Plasma API, okay? So the red ones are part of the Plasma API. You will notice that none of them are actually tier one, right? Uh, which is somewhat unsurprising, um, because that's for our platform where we use our framework, so yeah, that kind of makes sense. And so in that setup, what would be forbidden? Uh, what would be forbidden is a non-Plasma API, so something in gray, depending on the Plasma API framework, so something in red, okay? Uh, so we have our time to spot that still, uh, and changing the layout actually makes that uh, a bit better. Uh, so you might see that there's something fishy uh, going on in that particular area, uh, but there are still too many edges, right? So if we Fit out uh, the allowed edges and keep only the wrong one, right? We can see that there's something fishy here, something fishy there, right? Uh, and that layout is still not, not proper. So let's remove 
completely the ones which have no dependencies left, right? Uh, and that gives us the offenders, right? So at that point, we know uh, who, is, uh, who is offending. Um, and so there's not many left in there, so it's time to name them. Uh, so we have our short list of offenders that way, okay? We know that KIO is depending on KWallet, so that's a violation of something not part of Plasma API, which depends on it. Uh, and then we got XML GUI and uh, K declarative depending on K global Excel. Now we need to go one level deeper to actually know what inside of those frameworks does those dependencies. And what we find out is that inside of KAO, that's just K password server depending on uh, K wallet. Uh, and for K declarative and K XML GUI, uh, it's really there depending. Uh, on the library of K Global Excel, and that's mainly because why well, they have GUI to deal with shortcuts, right? So in the future, what what can we do? Well, that we have very good news from that exploration I did that not too many dependencies uh, to fix. So that's very good news, right? There's basically only three uh, right now, which are uh, which would be out loud uh, if we would go for a Plasma API approach. Uh, and we still want to have something uh, final grain, uh, so that's why I uh, used uh, FD sector for that. Uh, because now we want to get very precise and use a scalpel to cut whatever needs to be cut. So for our KAO, KWallet, uh, this dependency, that's basically K password server, as I said, which uses uh, just stuff to check a wallet, right? Uh, open it, uh, and then check if a key exists or not, right? That's basically the gist of it. Right, easy solution, right? We're, we're talking about uh, to keychain uh, to eventually move in inside KD frameworks. To keychain is a platform abstraction, right? So it can talk to K wallet, it can talk to, um, to the tiering on Mac and, uh, and the equivalent on Windows, right? So just port K, K password server to Q keychain and done, right? So that one is easy. Uh, for K global access, so there's a few more which are used, right? So we see that the default shortcut and the uh, shortcut by keys and getting the shortcut for an action and uh, to know if a global shortcut is available, right? All of that is uh, is used. Uh, we also get uh, things about uh, the shortcut info, right? And the dependencies, so where it gets interesting though is looking at where the dependencies come from, right? So they come from uh, key sequence widget, action collection, shortcut edit widget, Shortcuts editor, shortcuts editor item, and KXML GUI factory. The use cases when you start sorting them uh, by looking at the code in, in those and how they use the dependencies listed just before is basically setting, getting the color shortcuts, checking conflicts, ending the shortcut settings, and reacting to uh, our global shortcut which changes. We have potential solutions for that. Uh, so it already Inside of XML GUI, the work is already done to if def all of that, right? It already has an uh, have global Excel if def. Uh, this is a good starting point. Okay. Uh, now the downside to that is that we would have to decide at compile time. Uh, so I think what it misses is a strategy similar to what we have for K message dialogue and friends, right? Uh, which has, which is to have some sort of uh, facade uh, to abstract away the uses, uh, and then to have framework integration, right? So that would be our plugin interface, and then frame, uh, framework inter integration could deliver the plugin like it does already for a few classes inside of frameworks. Uh, and so this way, we would have um, we would have cut the dependency, right? While still having uh, all the features, if both. Uh, if both frameworks are installed plus the framework integration. Uh, so in that case, that becomes a deployment question, which is where we want to be at. For K declarative to award uh, K global Excel, that mainly comes from similar things uh, inside of Q, uh, K quick controls private plugins. Uh, and same thing, it's because it has um, something uh, which is called a key sequence item. Uh, and inside there, there's a key sequence helper. Uh, the only use case there is checking for conflict with global shortcuts, right? Uh, that code is pretty much duplicated from uh, XML GUI, by the way. Good news, it's relatively self-contained, though. Uh, potential, 
potential solution for that one. It's a very simple thing. Maybe just have a debus call for that one. Right? Uh, it's just about checking conflict, right? So just question and answer. Uh, debus could do the job in that case. Uh, that seems to be a common use case, though. Um, so if we go for that solution uh, instead of the facade in the declarative, we should probably remove the facade. Um, uh, we should probably uh, remove the the that particular check from the facade on the XML GUI side. All right, what now? Uh, so obviously, I mean, uh, if there's agreement on that, uh, then tasks should be added in the uh, KD Framework 6 workboard. Uh, and that would be like one task per unwanted dependency to solve. Uh, I didn't go around doing this because, as I said, that's kind of food for thought for the upcoming buff. Uh, so we need to settle on the solutions we want to pick for each of the cases first. Uh, and then we just have to implement the task. The good, again, the good news is that there are not many of them, right? Uh, and so then what? Profit, right? Well, not quite. Uh, because what I cover there is basically just the technical bits. Uh, the real challenge is there after that, in fact. Um, because then that means that we solved, as I said, with a scalpel, just a few of those, right? Uh, but then what happens about that big drift that I'm drawing between um, frameworks and Plasma API? Uh, that's the open question. Do we move the Plasma API frameworks out of KD frameworks? Um, uh, and that would have uh, community and release management implications, right? Where do they go? Should they be in a separate product, released at the same time uh, than KD frameworks? My personal opinion is that they should probably be within Plasma, uh, because there's value to release them in sync with Plasma releases. I mean, there's a reason, for instance, why we've seen the KYL and server bits move out of frameworks to go in Plasma. It's just a lot of headaches uh, when you have stuff which is released at different times where you have only one, you really have one primary uh, consumer of them or implementer of them. Um, obviously, that means that the Plasma team would have to commit to some uh, ABI or ABI guarantees similar to the KD Frameworks one for those parts of Plasma, right? For the Plasma API framework. And of course, that also has marketing implications, right? Because uh, I'm not quite sure how we would communicate uh, about this more widely. Uh, and obviously, we don't want to come out with the same message if it's uh, on the KD Frameworks recycle or if it's on the Plasma recycle or something else, right? All right, that's everything I had in store for uh, tonight. Uh, we still have a few minutes, uh, but not many. Uh, if you have any questions, I would try to answer. Uh, so, the first question is from David E. Uh, when is the relevant buff? Uh, that should be on Monday morning. Monday morning, okay. Uh, I hope he's satisfied by the answer. Uh, as far oh, as yeah, I concerned... think that's 9 UTC. If he... <laughs> Ooh, then he's not satisfied by the answer. <laughs> So uh, I just want to applaud the great work and obviously the, the great talk. Uh, all of the questions that popped up during the talk were answered by the following slides. So I kind of deleted them all because they were already answered. Perfect transitions then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this was, I guess, the most professional talk there that we had so far. No questions because you answered them all. <laughs> Please to serve. <laughs> Uh, okay, and it seems that nothing else is happening. So uh, thank you again, and uh, everybody give a warm applause to Kevin in the chat. Thank you. See you in the coming right. days. See you around. Cheers.